escort carriers. Well, this is where you get into an interesting discussion. Because... The idea, design, development, and notable operations. Well, if this is going to be, as it is intended to be, roughly an hour long, there isn't going to be much of a time for many notable operations and many developments, but hopefully I'm going to cover it all in roughly 75 minutes for a long patrol and three hours in line. Roughly. And hopefully this will go up on the Saturday rather than on the Thursday, because hopefully I will feel well enough to do a three-hour live on the Thursday. Hopefully. It's been a tough week. Um, not to put too fine a point on it, it's been interesting. And I wouldn't have got through it without some very interesting medications. Leave it to one side. So, Escort carriers. Well, there is a certain story which comes out with them. But really, the best person for putting them in putting out is David Hobbs and his book, Royal Navy Escort Carriers. And it starts off with this. The Royal Navy and the Admiralty did show some interest in the auxiliary or trade protection carriers converted from merchant ships, but have given priority to the larger carriers required for fleet work. Those sh these ships took up almost all the rele relevant allocations of tonnage under the Washington and subsequent naval treaties. For its part, the Royal Air Force opposed the increased number of naval aircraft that would have been required to embark in the trade protection carriers, which would have taken resources from its core program of bomb production. Border Trade had little enthusiasm for the conversion of merchant ships to fulfill roles for which they had not been intended. However, in 1936, Admiralty interest took a more tangible form when the Director of Naval Construction was instructed by the Third Sea Lord, it's not written here, but it is Henderson who does it, and of course the Director of Naval Construction at this point is Stanley Goodall, to produce designs for potential mercantile conversions. These included Winchester Castle, a ship of 20,000 tons, 631 feet, that's 192.33 metres long, and Wampuana, a smaller ship of 12,500 tons, 516 feet, that's 157.28 metres long. Others were, were also evaluated, but the pressure of rearmament, including the design and construction of the armoured illustrious class carriers, precluded any more development effort. Trade protection policy conferences in 1937 and 38 took the matter forward in principle, but in January 1939 they decided not to proceed with such ships since resources were required for other more important services. Even the outbreak of war in September 1939 failed to change the situation, since at an estimated 12 months, conversions were felt to take far too long to be practically justified. Sona, known at the time as ASDIC, after the Anti-Submarine Detection and Indication Committee of World War I, was widely fitted in service escorts and was believed to have effectively countered the threat posed by U-boats on the trade routes. The 1939 edition of the Royal Navy's fighting instructions discounted aircraft as being of any value for ocean movement and ocean convoy defence, stating that small escort forces and invasion could be relied upon to provide sufficient security during the ocean passage. Coastal command of the RAF and large flotillas were failed to augment the close escort in the approaches to the port. Experience showed how wrong this appreciation was, and in the same section of 1947 instructions, it was stated that carriers with a convoy provided a tactical air force for its defence. Please note, though, in 1939, when the Royal Navy was saying this, they have control of the French have control of France, and the Norwegians have control of Norway. This changes the world. Okay, you are ex the Royal British are expecting to be running a have a barrier across the English Channel, which will stop submarines going out, and have French support for our convoys. They're expecting to run their convoys in a southerly fashion, away as far away from the can as from the northern out approaches of the German submarines. The Germans don't have that many submarines at this point in operation, and the British expectation is that they will have to go out keeping out of Norwegian waters, keeping out, uh, avoiding British anti-submarine anti patrols in the North Sea, through the Greenland, Iceland, the UK gap, and into the North Atlantic. That is what they're expecting. Under those circumstances, they are presuming they are not going to have to deal with large concentrations of submarines. They're going to be individual submarines, and therefore, 
you know, their plans make sense. They have a logic to them. We know that isn't how the world works. We know how that's not how history plays out. But this is what it, they think about. And in the interwar period, Atreus Argus has been used in several exercises as a convoy escort. Now, if we continue on with Hobbes' introduction. In the opening stages of the war, cruisers were formed into hunter groups, some of which also included aircraft carriers to scour the oceans for German shipping and commerce raiders. A number of merchant ships were taken up from trade for conversion to armed merchant cruisers and ocean boarding vessels along lines with which, with which the 19th century navy would have been familiar. And which make perfect sense, because to take a merchant ship, you do not need to be a full-blown warship. You just need to have probably a naval crew and some guns fitted. Again, to be an extra picket ship. The use of aircraft carriers to provide air control over the convoys was not considered a priority, although due to a shortage of coastal command aircraft on the outbreak of war, fleet carriers were used to hunt new boats in what would otherwise have been used areas devoid of air cover. This ill-considered policy, using valuable assets to cover seas that might only be passed by a few independent rooted ships, cost the Royal Navy dear. On 14th September, a torpedo fired by U-boat narrowly missed Ark Royal. On 17th September, Courageous was sunk by torpedoes fired by U-29, with loss of 518 lives in a highly trained air group. The fall of France and in Norway in the summer of 1940 changed the whole balance of the war at sea. German aircraft, including the Focke-Wulf 200, the Condors of KG-40, could range far out into the East Atlantic, locating convoys and attacking them with bombs. U-boats from the new bases such as Lorient could pass into the Atlantic more easily than their predecessors in 1914-18 and operate far more la uh, far from land in mid-ocean, where surface escorts were few in number and coastal command aircraft could not reach. Death ship measures were taken to counter the effort. These included fighter catapult, sh catapult ships manned by the Royal Navy with a handful of fighters and catapult armed merchant ships or cam ships. We're fitted with a single RAF man hurricane fighter on a capital a catapult over, over the bow. If launched out of range of land, the fighter had to ditch near the convoy with certain loss of the aircraft and possible loss of the pilot. This led to an understandable reluctance to launch in any but the most ideal circumstances. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill announced his Battle of the Atlantic Directive in autumn 1940, and this gave top priority to defeat of U-boats, and a series of important developments resulted, including the transfer of coastal command to the Admiralty's operational control. This need to fill the mid-Atlantic gap with aircraft was imperative, and in the autumn of 1940, Captain Matthew Slattery, Director of Air Material on the Admiralty, proposed fitting the simplest possible flight deck and the rest of the wires to civil merchant ships. At the same time, Rear Admiral William Halsey, USN, warned that the US Navy would require the conversion of civil merchant hulls to augment the fleet carriers for training and transport should the USA be drawn into war. They're all, to an extent, based on this vessel, which is a converted liner. It's very cheap, very simple. HMS Argus. It starts off life theoretically as a fleet carrier, but never really carries enough aircraft. Maybe a fleet escort carrier to provide air defense against, uh, well, Zeppelins. But most of her life she spends being a proto escort carrier, or actually an escort carrier. In simple terms, small carriers for the role of trade protection were under consideration for a long time. Plans in 1936, but exercises and things have been testing them out in the 1920s. It was known that naval aviation was vital for convoy protection and maritime protection and force protection. As I've said several times on various videos, one of the reasons that the Admiralty opposed the decision to stall carrier as well as capital ship, i.e. battleship construction, in 1939 when the government made the one-size-fits-all this must be our standard decision because obviously we have enough for the war was because of anti-submarine warfare. There will always be resource issues. No one operates in a world where they have infinite resources. Well, saying that, there is a computer game called... Mm -hmm. 
Strategic Command, I seem to remember. Haven't played it in a while. And Supreme Commander, I think it's actually called. Supreme Commander, yes. That's what it's called. And you do have an experimental machine, which you can build if you're one faction, which gives you infinite power and infinite mass. So you can build whatever you want and power whatever you want. It's amazing. However, that's a computer game, not real life. In real life, you have to make a decision. In real life, you have to decide what you're going to spend money on. Now, if you think your aircraft are primarily going to have to be patrolling the UK-Norway gap, where if they keep flying across there constantly, submarines, which will have to be on the surface, because at this point, submarines are more submersible than submarine. In that, yes, they go underwater, but they're not particularly fast, and they can't stand that they're particularly long. What they have to do if they want to get anywhere in any kind of decent time while they've got fuel and food remaining is transit on the surface. So if you've got aircraft flying backwards and forwards, especially once you get surface radar, you can spot these submarines and you can engage them. And if you force them to, uh, to go beneath the waves, they have problems. And this is actually what anti-carriers and anti-submarine warfare in the 1920s really is about. It's one of the problems with exercises, because exercises sometimes are quite short exercises, and a submarine can stay underwater for the entire time. It can't go much of anywhere. It's not really going to move around much, but it can stay underwater for the entire exercise. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, the aircraft flying overhead keeps it underwater. It stops it moving. And that's enough for your anti-submarine warfare at certain points. It's enough to stop the submarine being able to move around. It's enough to reduce its flexibility and mobility. Because if it's stuck down over there, and your convoy's passing somewhere over here, that's probably far too far away for it to actually fire its weapons effectively. So yeah, you can stay the water. That doesn't bother us. A mission kill is as good as a kill. Because if you stop the submarine from accomplishing a mission, you get the convoy through. If you get the convoy through, you win. That's the thing about the convoy war and the anti-submarine warfare war. Killing the submarine is good. It stops it being a threat for future. And stops its crew accruing experience, which can then feed into other submarines to make them more effective. However... It's, that's a bonus. That's a cherry on top. That's icing in a cherry. The cake, the filling, that's getting the convoy through. That is literally the convoy arriving with as many ships as possibly intact and able to deliver their supplies. That's what you want. When people argue this with me and they go, no, 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 you're supposed to be killing submarines, etc. I turn around and go, so if you are the convoy commodore and you arrive in Liverpool and you turn around to the Admiral and go, it was a very successful convoy, sir. I lost all 50 of my merchant ships, but we sank 20 submarines. Would they be happy with you? No, they wouldn't. However, if you turned round to your admiral and said, uh, Sir, we got all 50 merchant ships across, but we didn't sing a signal submarine. Hooray! That's the metric for winning the convoy war. It's not how many submarines you sink, it's whether or not you get the convoy across. And that's also the metric for anti-submarine warfare in the 1920s, if we start looking at the aircraft being used, the Ferry 3F. 100 pound bombs, anti-submarine warfare, 100 pound bombs. They are what are developed in this period, and you sit there and go, well, how, what damage are they going to do? Well, if your submarine is on the surface, and they do hit them, 
they could cause some minor damage. I mean, I'm not expecting much. But the thing is, any damage they do cause is going to worry the submarine's crew. Again, the submarine has the surface raider's Achilles heel. But it's worse. A submarine which is on the surface is exposed. A submarine which is damaged doesn't want to be underwater. Because if there's been damage to the pressure hull, etc., they need to repair it if they want to try and get home. Because there is nowhere for them to pop in to get maintenance and support. So a submarine which cannot dive is dead. Because if it's caught on the surface, there ain't no way it's getting out alive. A submarine which is damaged, therefore, on and damaged, and therefore is forced to surface, and is a long way from home. It doesn't matter how much you damaged it. In fact, it helps if you have damaged it rather than sunk it. Damaged enough, it can attempt to get home. Because what is the likely reaction going to be of the high command? I know they abandoned the Africa Corps, etc., and the Italian troops in North Africa. They didn't send the supplies, the personnel that the British were expecting them to, to try and evacuate them. But they weren't like that with their submarines. The Kriegsmarine wasn't like that. They would send people out to protect them. They'd send other submarines out. They'd send aircraft. They'd send motor torpedo boats. They'd send their destroyer flotilla. You would want to damage a ship, damage a boat, enough that it had to be escorted home because that could give you, you more kills. This is, of course, not worked out. Known in the 1920s, this is what will happen. But in the 1920s, the British are working on anti submarine warfare. The British are working on it from the perspective of they need it. But also, they can't really fund it. My normal complaint on the British is that in the 1920s and 30s, you have no limit on how many soups you can build. So you could be building a permanent force of 18, 24 sloops a year. Just churn them out across the empire. There's no treaty restrictions on them at all. You can't do the same for carriers, especially after the Washington Treaty. You can't do the same. Well, not after Washington Treaty, after the London Treaty. London Treaty fixes the, uh, the Washington Treaty makes it interesting, but you do have a gap as the Japanese try to exploit, and then the Washington, uh, the London Treaty closes that gap. But still, the British have these old experimental carriers they could replace at any time, that they could replace at any time, and they don't. Why? Because keeping them around in service, A, keeps your numbers up, and allows you to claim to have more carriers in service than anyone else, which they do. The utility of some of them is variable. But there again, that's a utility based on the supposed metric of the Royal Navy only focusing on fleet carriers. Argus, Hermes, they're not really good for much. They're not eagle or furious, certainly not courageous and glorious, or Ark Royal. What they are good for is exercises, is testing out, is Working out how you're going to convoy, how you're going to patrol, how you're going to protect against surface raiders. Because that's the other thing CAR is useful for. Watching for surface raiders. Scouring a large area of ocean. And again, we know that the surface raider threat is largely handled. That the Grass Bay gets sunk at the Battle of the River Plate. The Deutschland gets ordered home to change its name because Hitler's worried about Germany getting sunk. 
that Sean Horse and Nice and Al come out and do a epic raid, which almost results in Nice and Al having a very nasty fate at the hands of HRS Rodney, which for half or not more could have caused complete another uproar for just half or not more. We know that when Bismarck comes out, she scores a victory at Denmark Strait, but ultimately gets lost. We know all this. We know the surface radar impact in World War II. But in 1920s and 30s, they don't. And those are just the big warship surface radars. There's also things like the Cormoran, etc., which go around. Again, having these escort carriers, having smaller carriers around all over the place would have been incredibly useful. But they require tonnage under the treaty system, and they require funding from the Treasury. And if the Royal Navy didn't even get funding from the Treasury for something they did have the tonnage for, i.e. sloops, Trying to get it for, uh, for escort carriers? Very, very difficult. Now, I will say that the fact that the debates had gone on to 1939 is interesting. And I will point out that HMS Unicorn is ordered in 1939. And that, of course, is... Uh, forward aviation support ship not an aircraft carrier although it does become of course a template for light fleet carriers I would be tempted to see what would have happened further on in the construction program because in 1939, the Royal Navy gets control of the fleet air arm completely. They start ordering Unicorn. They've got some larger carriers on the order. They've had plans being drawn up since 1936 for conversion of merchant ships to escort carriers. The Royal Navy of 1942, if war hadn't broken out, could well have included some very interesting ships. It might have been a lot more unicorns, which could have done the escort carrier role, certainly spent enough time, for time hanging out with them, or could have actually included some conversions. We won't know. We won't know. But it's interesting to think about. In the 1930s, the role of a carrier in anti-submarine warfare changes. They start to become more and more about prosecuting it. As Hobbs said, you've got some cruisers. You've also you've got them hunting out with destroyers, etc. Hunting submarines proactively. Going offensive for the anti-submarine warfare. So the idea was you would both convoy and escort convoys. But you would also hunt, hunt them down. And what's interesting to note is that they just don't have enough assets in the beginning of World War II to do this. But by the end of World War II, they are pretty much enacting that policy. And that's one of the reasons why I say things like the Type 21, Type 20, uh, 20L, the very, the very fancy subs which the Germans are coming up with at the end of World War II might not have had the impact that they're often believed by those who are fervent advocates of them to have had the impact. The reason is they'll be running into not the Royal Navy of 1940, 41, in terms of anti submarine warfare, they're running into the Royal Navy of 1945. And that, in terms of anti submarine warfare, A, has a lot better Aztec sonar than it did in 1940. But B has a lot of escort carriers and has a lot of aircraft to go hunting, including a lot of fairy sawfish, which were designed to be very stable and fly long ranges at night, which turned out to be very useful for hunting submarines. 
And in this formation, they're carrying a load of rockets. They could carry depth charges, searchlights, very powerful searchlights, and radar. And the radar, of course, allows you to spot things as small as a periscope popping up above the waves. Or maybe even a snorkel popping up above the waves. Would it necessarily work? Who knows? But the thing is, you're running into a comprehensive anti-submarine warfare system in place with long-range land-based aircraft patrolling, escort carriers providing constant sweeps around their convoys, all the intelligence gathering materials, all the listening posts, all the hummet that's possible, and escorts which are far more numerous, far more capable than they were. That is not a good scenario. This is not the world's fastest aircraft, by a long shot. But it's more than fast enough to outpace a submarine, especially one operating below the water. It's more than fast enough to do its patrol and be in places you don't want it to be. It's more than fast enough to spot a target, spot something interesting on the radar, and hunt it down at night. And that's the important thing, again, being able to hunt them down at night. There is a certainty that no one is getting to do the internal, you know, running up the center of the convoy tactics again, because that's just not going to work well for them. And this is also HMS Unicorn, which I discussed earlier. Again, one of the ships delayed. She is laid down in June 1939. She isn't launched till November 1941. And then she's completed in March 1943. She's one of the ships which suffers most from the delay put in on aircraft carriers and escort. Well, aircraft carriers and capital ships in favor of escorts. Now, again, you can understand this, but this ship's being built by Harlan Wolf in Belfast. She's not going to get bombed as much as the ship's being built in Newcastle, etc. So you could build her quite quickly. She, including, excluding her, her armament, she would cost two and a half million pounds. And she takes this long to complete when even though the Admiralty decided in 1942 that she would not be equipped with her full suite of maintenance and radar equipment. Or maintenance and repair equipment. She would have the full suite of radar equipment. Sorry. So she's actually completed closer to a carrier than a maintenance carrier or forward aviation support ship. Now, if we consider her size, she is 16,770 tons in standard, 20,600 tons in deep load. So she's far bigger than Argus, which displaced 14,680 tons in standard and 16,028 tons in deep load or the first escort carrier, I would argue, uh, HMS Audacity, which was 11,000 tons. And, yeah, her air group, well, she could carry approximately 33 aircraft. Argus, hmm, 15 to 18 at best, usually less. Audacity. Hmm. Eight in storage, six in operational use. As a rule. And those were stored 
on the de flight deck for Audacity. Unicorn had a hanger. The Royal Navy is therefore heading in a direction where they are planning on more aircraft for use in any submarine warfare. But it's difficult to get in, get buy-in from the various partners. I think it's always rather interesting to point out the board of trade here. And the fact that sort of the board of trade are mm, not that keen. on the Royal Navy taking and converting merchant ships and doing this. Uh, it's... How do I put this? Hobbes' phrase is the Board of Trade had little enthusiasm for the conversion of merchant ships to fulfil roles for which they had not been intended. Yeah! I can understand the Board of Trade going, we want you to focus on using warships for a warship role, and not nicking our ships. We don't have enough ships as it is. But, and I say this with well-meaning intent, this puts a problem for the Royal Navy. You can do conversions in almost any yard. But there are a limited number of yards which it can actually build an aircraft carrier. And if the Royal Navy is building an aircraft carrier, then there is the cost. And there is going to be need of, well, should we build, waste our money building a small carrier when for not much more money, because considering all the facilities we probably put in a, an actual built carrier, especially pre-war, we could probably get a bigger, more useful asset, which could also do fleet work, i.e. a unicorn-sized vessel. Mm -hmm. Conversions are the way to go. Unless you're in wartime. And I think that's part of the problem for the Royal Navy as they approach World War II. It's getting people to understand that war is coming. There is the fact that the 10-year rule theoretically ends in 1942. That's when it, 1932, that's when it officially ends. So officially, that's when the, the governor said, Oh, we expect war to happen after 1942, so we need to be prepared for it in 42. But in actual fact, the Treasury Act, like the 10-year rule, still is in existence and still working until 1937, arguably until 1938 which pushes back the year for preparing for war to 1947. Which makes it a lot scarier. Because, of course, as we all know, World War II is over by 1946 being uh, finished. Even the war in the East. And that's the other problem for escort carriers. Because if I'm making the case for it, in 1937, 1938, 39. Germany is one of three big threats. Germany's got barely any submarines. Yes, they're talking big, big getter things with their plans, etc. But they're not actually delivering on them. They don't have the mass volume of submarines we associate with them later in the war. They don't. So, what do I do? Do I need uh, do I need escort carriers to fight the Japanese? Well, they the converted merchant ships probably be useful for fighting Japanese and making sure I get aircraft supplied to where I need to operate my fleet. But I'm not. I can probably take the time to convert those when war starts because I'll first have to move the assets out there before I have to sustain them, and um, yeah, that's fighting a Far East war. And there are actual admirals going around going, "Oh, 
we probably won't be able to do that under this circumstance. And this circumstance, i.e. if we're fighting in New Orleans, Europe, will we be able to send a full fleet to the Far East? Ooh, that's an iffy one. What happens if I'm fighting Italy? Do I need escort carriers for that? Well, probably not, because I'll probably seal up the Italians in the Mediterranean and just send the merchant ships around there. Why would I send them through the Mediterranean if I'm fighting the Italians? First of all, I beat them up in North Africa, along with my French allies, who will, of course be fighting alongside me. And then once we kick them out of North Africa, if we need to do any convoys or any merchant ships through North Africa, we just hug in through the Mediterranean, we just hug the North African coast and they'll have friendly air cover the whole way. There is a lot of logical thinking going on. Not even a bit worst case scenario, really. Uh, it, it's the worst imagined case scenario. The idea of France falling out of the war, of Norway being conquered, is just not thought about. Just not considered as a likely possibility. Why? Because the France have put, the France put up with the whole of World War I, fought the whole way through. Why would you expect them to fall out? One of the interims you have before the escort carriers really come into production is, of course, the Mack ships. Uh, their first generation are pretty interesting. They approximately 8,000 tons deep loaded, 12 knots, 4 aircraft carried, a uh, crew of 107. Um, they did have a hangar and lift, which was unusual. It was unusual. Most of the rest didn't. And one of the other things that's sort of interesting when it comes up is when you start talking about the British British escort carriers versus the Americans and how they're converted. Uh, people always seem to go on about washing machines, and I go, hmm? I think the uh, there was sort of someone who went, oh, the British sailor only needs soap and water to keep clean. There is also... A very real point in the British idea that when they're getting the escort carriers, uh, their purpose is to go backwards and forwards. I don't think they take out complete all the heavy duty washing machines. There is, I think, there is a sort of that's sort of overdone. But certainly, some of the things the British do at conversions are well convert things like fill in gaps on their sides etc to make them better for going through cold weather for the arctic operations and various things to do with fuel pipelines etc which again the americans end up copying mostly most of the things the british do to the initial batches the americans end up copying audacity audacity is the first of the escort carriers and she's special she is well starts life as the ss hanover mm -hmm. a german vessel which is captured in the west indies in march 1914 then she's renamed Simbad, then Empire Audacity, then becomes HMS Empire Audacity, and then is or HMS Audacity. She has a very short service life. She's captured on the 7th of March 1940 and sunk on the 21st of December 1941. So, as you can imagine, she goes through name changes rather quickly, and she goes through changes rather quickly. She embarks an air group of Grumham Martlets, aka Wildcats, from 802 Naval Air Squadron, which of course includes the wonderful Eric Winkle Brown, who goes on to be one of the greatest test pilots ever, and to have probably flown more aircraft than anyone else ever has, or probably will, just because of the fact of the sheer volume of aircraft he flew when they were producing dozens of aircraft a year rather than one every other decade. So in types of aircraft, he's probably outflew anyone else on ever will, unless we really change the global economy and global procurement. 
Now, in her short life, which pretty much as an, a warship lasts from July 1941 to December 1941, from the 31st of July to the 21st of December. So, we are, you know, we're talking less than five months. She escorts four convoys. OG-74, HG-74, OG-76, and HG-76. And her main purpose is not anti-submarine warfare. No, no, no. She is there to take out the Fokker Wolves. She's there to take out the Condors. And she does this very well, thank you very much. Basically... Her purpose was not anti-submarine. It was take out the aircraft. Why take out the Fokker Wolves? Why take out those reconnaissance bombers? Because if you took them out, then the submarine wolf packs were less likely to find you. Because their reports were guiding in the submarine wolf packs. And if you were taking out the reconnaissance aircraft... You then gave the lovely people at at Bletchley Park more plausible deniability, which is useful because, trust me, the most important thing you need for intelligence protection and to protect especially the signals analysis, let alone the code breaking going on, is plausible deniability. Because if you guide around too many wolf packs using the knowledge of the radio, uh, knowledge that your ability to, well, your signals analysis for starters, let alone actually cracking their codes, the signals analysis departments were actually showing you, then you would have a problem. You kind of reveal your hand. But if you start shooting down reconnaissance aircraft and stopping them from reporting or making sure their reports are inaccurate, ooh. Suddenly, there is an obvious reason the German High Command has to believe why they're missing convoys. It's there staring them in the face. It's the obvious thing. Which is why it's kind of interesting how she ends up dying. Because the Germans are ordered... Well, they basically tell their submarines that if they see her, sink her. Because she's causing so much problems. And she's been in service for just a few months. It's kind of like, you know, she's sort of going, Hello, me and Ark Royal were a club or two. Both of us have been ordered, you've been ordered to go and sink. Ark Royal, the big famous strike carrier, and Audacity, the escort carrier. Although, um, interestingly enough, uh, Captain Lieutenant uh, Gerard Begat in charge of U-751, which fired the torpedo which sunk her, thought he was sinking an illustrious class aircraft carrier. Um, so, and that's what Nazi propaganda described her as. Um, in actual fact, she was, of course, a converted German merchant vessel of 11,000 tons rather than a 23,000 ton illustrious class, but, you know... Again, the Royal Navy is always happy for the Germans to be announcing that they've sunk far larger ships than they have, because when they turn up, it's kind of... The Germans, I have to admit, they haven't sunk them, or they have to claim the British are building have built more of them than they have, or the British are magically building more of them than they have and renaming ships. Either way, helps cause more problems for the Germans than it does for the British. So really the Mac ships, Audacity, the work of Argus at this point in the war, have all added up to showing the value of escort carriers. The Americans, remember, were approaching merchant carriers from the point of view of supplying aircraft to their fleet. The British had certainly looked at them from that perspective in the 1930s for war against Japan, as well as for convoy escort as well. If we consider some of those earlier plans talked about, the ones especially when it comes to um, Winchester Castle. 
that was really looked at from the perspective to a perspective of its utility for multiple operations. And at 20,000 tons, that's a big ship. That would have been the size of, well, not far off Unicorn. Then, well, let's be honest, it would be heavier than Unicorn and not far off the size of Illustrious class. Hmm. Good ship. Interesting ship. The Unicorn, of course, is 195 meters long. Uh, 0.1 meters long, and Winchester is 192.3 meters long. So, uh, yeah, they'd been about the same size. So, now come in the escort carriers, and the question is, what to use them for? How to use them? Convoys have already been saying at this point. The British have developed a sort of layered approach to convoys, where you find a mixture of, a mixture of escorts, providing close protection and distant protection. And there's a debate how you use carriers, escort carriers within that. When it starts out with HMS Audacity, she wanders around the convoy quite a bit, and she's actually sunk because she's illuminated by a snowflake flare. So she's lost thanks to a snowflake. And the flares put up to help the merchant vessel see what it thinks is going to be attacking it. And what it does is illuminate her beautifully, allowing the German submarines to spot her in the dark. Now, the reason they detached from the convoy was to enable them to better operate and launch their aircraft. Because you needed to turn into the wind to launch and recover aircraft. What's interesting about this is the British, again, this is the British to an extent failing to learn from their own experience because they'd already reached the point that with fleet carriers, etc., when they are to, when they need to launch aircraft, the fleet goes with them. <laughs> you didn't let the fleet. It wasn't a case of, ah, oh, the aircraft carrier needs to turn launch. Okay, we'll let them wander in and out of the escort to go and launch. No, 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 we go with them. HMS Illustrious. Adrian's formidable, they're with the fleet when the fleet manoeuvres. And the British should have gone to the convoy, yeah, Audacity's moving around. And then afterwards, that's never happening again. So, here is the cruising formation of PQ-18, which I'm using here to illustrate how it evolves in terms of how the escort carrier is used. Now, you will notice that now there is a box back here that there is space which an escort carrier can drop into to do its operations of its aircraft if it needs to which hopefully allows it to do so without falling too far away from the convoy you also notice that it's not just the escort carrier in this formation there are also submarines yes there are submarines which are also sitting at the back they're useful because you know if a surface raider decides to come chasing you well, you have the opportunity to launch some aircraft, maybe from the escort carrier, which you do have us carry a few torpedoes aboard to go, uh, for your sawfish to go and attack something. And you probably don't want to use your C-class cruiser, but if you have any fleet destroyers in that destroyer screen, instead of them mostly being hunt class, then they can probably be formed up. But also, there's the submarines. Then your nasty sting in the tail for any surface raider co coming after your convoy. There are submarines there. Okay, they're proceeding on the surface in the convoy, hence they're buried in the convoy. Because otherwise they couldn't keep up with the convoy. This is one of the things, again, about submarines. This is the point about using aircraft to deter submarines. Once they're below the water, they're slow. They're not going anywhere. So you basically aircraft... What's great is the aircraft doesn't really even have to see the submarine for it to have an impact on the submarine. Because a submarine sees an aircraft, it presumes it's seen, and dies. So just having the aircraft flying around does some of your work for you. These are all the benefits of having an escort carrier. And... This formation is all sort of centered on the various operations of what things are going. The oilers are stuck at the back. The They are sort of, again, hidden. They're, you've got the AA ships involved. 
and positioned in the wings of the convoy. But also, you'll notice that they have got slightly more ships on this side than they have on the northern side. Which is kind of an interesting thing, because of course PQ-18 is an Arctic convoy. It's a convoy going north. And where are the likely threats coming from? South. That's where the aircraft are likely to be attacking from, broadly speaking, the south. So you have this kind of formation here. You have the ability, therefore, that these ships, as much as you don't want to lose any ships in your convoy, your most expendable ships, or rather your relatively more expendable than the ones you, than, uh, than others, are probably on yourself. Which we'll be seeing later when we look at the formation when it's closed up for air defence. Because, as you can see, it does close up for air defence. And this illustrates it again rather well. This illustrates it because, as you can see, the destroyers pull in. Now, what you don't see here is the fact that two other stern destroyers. And usually, usually it's the destroyer leader on this side. But. It can be destroyer leader on the other side, whichever side she's on when she dives off. If for operating air, uh, for getting up aircraft, they really the Avenger, that's the name of the escort carrier, needs to really motor and really move away from the convoy. Those would go with her. The trawlers were supposed to be enough to deal with any tail end Charlies. That's any submarines which might be following them. And there are four positioned there. And those two destroyers which move into the closer positions must always stay with the formation. Now, the Corvettes, etc. Probably, they could just about keep up with her at 17 knots. But they couldn't keep ahead of her. And that's what the escorting destroyers have to do. They have to take a position up around her. And basically, when if she has to detach off to go and launch aircraft and has to go chase air, to basically go chase the wind, then they have to position them around them. Now, this is another reason you want to use the swordfish, because the swordfish requires minimal wind to take off. You can use rockets and various other things, so you can take off in virtually no wind, which means you don't have to do it that often. That This is one of the reasons why the swordfish doesn't get replaced. It's because it basically is the biplane version of a helicopter. It's the slightest breeze. Hello, we're airborne! Hallelujah! That's what makes... This is one of the things that makes the escort carrier actually work, is the swordfish. Again, that thing that people write off as being a reject from World War I, as something almost pointless, really, really useful. We also notice that Avenger has a second spot. Because usually she'll be moving around in the box, which I described at the back. And if there's an any air attack detected coming inbound, which are most likely detected by her radar or the radar on the air defense cruiser, because they're the longest range radars they're going to have, then she'll move into whichever spot is closer to her, either into her first position or her second position. This is to try and hide her amongst the, air, amongst the convoy. Now, of course, the first position... The northerly position is far safer because that's the away from the enemy side. The southerly position is the most exposed. And again, I'll be showing you why that's the case when we're talking through PQ-18 later. So this is how you manage an escort carrier within a convoy. Now, her purpose is to basically maintain a consistent operation. It doesn't matter how many aircraft she can launch. If she could launch a full alpha strike, wonderful, but with only one catapult, that's highly unlikely. This doesn't matter with her construction. She also probably doesn't need to, when doing air convoys, the escort convoys, doesn't need to be at sea for that long. And this is something which the Japanese were all, had also figured out. This is Tayo, which is one of their first escort carrier, uh, carriers, which is a conversion as well. And... She really simplifies this approach in that she is very much focused, first of all, on ferrying aircraft and then on being used to actually escort convoys. Now, that's rather interesting because, again, as I said at the beginning and as I said in the live, ferrying aircraft is a big thing. It's where a lot of the ideas for these ships come on because... When the British are talking about war with Japan in the 1920s and 1930s, they're looking at converting 
ships into escort carriers, principally to be ferries. The scenario where you need escort carriers for anti-submarine warfare, which again they do look at and do experiment with thanks to Argus and Hermes, is war with Germany. And again, that's a war with Germany, and I know I'm saying this a lot, but I need to, uh, this needs to be quite clearly made. It's based on a war of Germany analysis where France doesn't fall and Norway doesn't fall. Because if in the 1920s you had turned around to anyone and you'd gone, well, in 1940, France is going to fall within weeks. And they're going to go from being a staunch ally who's ke who keeping their promises who are going to uh, fight by our side and will continue to fight on no matter what happened to being neutral to the point at which we don't trust them anymore because of the way they go neutral and we're going to end up attacking their fleet. You would have been laughed at. You'd have been sent off to an asylum for rest as obviously your overwork had stressed you out to the point at which you were now no longer talking, talking nonsense. But really, the two powers who most needed to be building escort carriers were Britain and Japan. And, you could argue, America needed them to get their aircraft across the Pacific as well. But Japan needed them because they have no strategic debt for their tra maritime trade. All their maritime trade mostly takes place in the Pacific. And it's all around their islands, and they're dependent on it. So if they can't escort it and protect it, they're in real trouble. The British war with Japan. Well, you block them off at Singapore, you and then you fight north from Singapore through the South China Sea and up the uh, up, you know, the coast of China, etc., towards Japan. In other words, all your trade in the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic should be safe because how are they going to get to it? Maybe surface raiders, but in that case, you're going to have old cruisers wandering around the world, probably C and D class vessels, which should be enough to deal with most surface raiders, anything that gets past them. If you're Britain, fighting Italy, well, they can be still up in the Mediterranean. That's not going to be cause you any trouble in terms of protecting your trade. Um, Japan, as I said, far away. Germany is the only one who can potentially cause you trouble. Uh, potentially. And then they've got to, well, you'd presume you'd be fighting alongside France, so you'd block off the channel. And you presume Norway would be at least a neutral slash beneficent neutral. In which case, you could be patrolling right up to their coast with ships and aircraft. That's going to keep submarines down. And as I said, the more you can keep a submarine's head down underwater, the shorter you make its range. Because it needs to be cruising on the surface to charge its batteries. It needs to be cruising on the surface to be able to operate at best speed. And needs to be cruising on the surface to be able to get its best range. The, the If you make it have to pass underwater for a large chunk of of it getting out to its operational zone, you're going to cut down its operational radius. And this is the point about getting Norway versus getting France. Norway, you're still going to have to go underwater quite a lot to get past significant patrols. France, you're straight out into the Atlantic. There is a big difference. On the map, it says it's not that much different from Norway to, uh, to America and then France to America. But in terms of operational terms, it's massively different. And this affects how you do your anti-submarine warfare and affects, of course, the close-up of air defense. And this is another factor which you have to remember with these escort carriers. When they close up for air defense, how many aircraft does an escort carrier usually have? Usually, they're actually focused on swordfish. But they often carry a few Hellcats. Maybe six. And their purpose mainly is to shoot down things like... Condors. But maybe also to break up heavy air attacks if they can be launched in time. If they're carrying them. If they're not carrying any, which sometimes they don't, then, well, you're closing up for air defense and you're hoping you're okay. But please note, the merchant vessels sunk. The vast majority are in these two lines in the south. There is one right at the end at the top. There's one right at the front. There's one here. And there's one at the back. This is why they close up for air defense. This is why it's also important to keep 
that escort carrier, preferably on the top side, on the north. It makes it safer. That's why that's its first position and the other one's its second position. Although, again, the escort carrier carries far more air defense than any of these vessels do. It's something which comes with experience. But it also is, to an extent, known about pre-war. And that's what makes the whole debate about resources and resource allocation. You're talking about fighting as a whole nation and a whole national war effort and where you're going to allocate the resources. Looking back, we can say honestly that Britain in 1937 should have started building these. Or they should have worked out a Hermes design, which was 500 tons cheaper. Uh, 500 tons cheaper in terms of Washington allowance. Uh, so it was 10,000 uh, some tons and kept building them in the interwar years. And then when the London Treaty came up, get some kind of agreement through that those, those uh, carriers do not count towards the total tonnage. Or they count towards a separate tonnage. Carriers up to, let's say, 11,000 tonnes or 12,000 tonnes, let's say. Let's, be, let's say they make it 12,000 tonnes, would count towards a different tonnage than was those ones which were allowed up to 27,000 tonnes. Or you could make it 13,500 tonnes. You could say you can have 13 and a half, uh, 135,000 tons of 13,500 ton carriers and, 27, 000, uh, and 13, 135,000 tons of 27,000 ton carriers and then watch the British try and figure out what they're going to do. That would have been a sensible thing, but that's all with hindsight and with knowledge. As it was, they didn't. And so we end up with a scenario where you don't have escort carriers, you don't have them available at the beginning of the war. You also have the scenario you don't have the sloops at the beginning of the war. But no. Oh well. On to the escort carriers as they were. But here is HMS Biter and HMS Avenger. Avenger only serves in 1942 before she gets lost. Biter serves 1942 to 5 and then eventually becomes part of the French Navy. And this image is actually taken from the deck of HMS Victorious. Mm-hmm. Which is an interesting thing to think about, that they are sort of sitting there, they're off operating with HMS Victorious, doing what they do, and being part of all those operations. At a certain point, you have to start using escort carriers to fill in for the lack of fleet carriers, because especially for the British, but even for the Americans, the Americans have more needs than they have aircraft carriers. The British have a lot more needs than they have aircraft carriers. And especially thanks to that sort of delay, the British are even more dependent on going, hang on, can which can, these are flight decks. Are we producing enough of them? Are we getting enough of them? Can we use them for other things? Because the light fleet carriers, the fleet carriers, all the things which should have been built, Atrus, Unicorn, etc., were not available at the times they were supposed to be built, available. And whilst these ships start out and are very much focused on fighting that battle Atlantic, on filling that mid-ocean gap, once you have enough to do that, and you also have enough to go and do hunter groups, well, if you have any more, there's other things for them to do. And even when you have those options, well, does every convoy need and its own escorting carrier because if you can just fit one on one in two and the air the aircraft carriers in some in, in convoys which have them can also provide aircraft to support carriers at convoys which don't then that gives you those carriers to do things like well not convoy work my carriers will stay here if we have to row back Rear Admiral, then Rear Admiral Philip Vian, Force 5, V, or Task Force 88, depending on who you're talking to. To understand more about what Vian thought about his force, well, here's action this day. The landing place selected, the Gulf of Salerno, 30 miles south of Naples, was just within range of Spitfires based on Sicily. They could only remain in the area for 20 minutes on each sortie. Consequently, only nine fighters at a time could be provided, out of the numbers then available. The Admiralty therefore dispatched to the Mediterranean fleet a force of five carriers, Unicorn, Smaller, Battler, Attacker, Hunter, and Stalker. It was to command these ships, together with the cruisers Euras, Scylla, and Shubis, 
and 10 destroyers that I was sent in the hours next appointed. So, according to Ian, 10 destroyers, but I can only find the names of 8 of them. At the time of this news, uh, the staff and myself were in camp above Algiers, at the headquarters of General Sir Charles Alfrey, the commander of 5th Corps. We are planning to carry out an operation designed to seize Taranto. This idea was abandoned in favour of assault on Naples. General Alfrey was an inspiring commander to work with, and I conceived an unqualified admiration for him. But for a doubt about his eyesight, he seemed certain to achieve the highest posts. Doubt about his eyesight. Yeah, we had uh, this guy might be partially blind, but frankly, we will deal with that. Because he's good at his brains, what we want, not the ability to see. Generals don't have to go see things themselves. 27th August 1943, my flag was hoisted in Eurus. I was happy to find the ship still in charge of the unwearied Boo Server, Captain Eric Bush. Uh, she had been in the 15th Cruiser uh, Squadron. I was altogether inexperienced in the operation of a force of aircraft carriers, but this efficiency was in part repaired by the unparalleled generosity of Rear Admiral Clement Moody, who lent me his own Chief Staff Officer. This was no less a man than Captain Guy Grantham, lately Flag Captain in Naid. Admiral Moody, a seasoned carrier commander, flew his flag at that time in Illustrious, which, with a second fleet carrier, then formed part of Admiral Willis's battle force. This was to cover my ships from attack from seaward and to afford them air protection. Our own aircraft would be operating over the beaches and will not be available to protect the carriers from which they flew. Moody, who might well have been disappointed that the commander of the independent inshore carrier force had not fallen to himself, was entirely unresentful and went to endless pains in helping Captain Grantham and me to produce a workable flying plan. The difficulty here was that, for necessary reasons, our force was allotted only a small sea area off Salerno from which to operate. Aircraft. The maximum speed of our Woolworth carriers was only 17 knots, and they must turn into a wind for flying aircraft off and on. The prob problem was how, with so little speed, and whilst remaining within our area, to have the ships back at the leeward and in, in time for the next flying operation. However, Tactical difficulties of this kind were nothing by comparison with the problems with which the assault leaders were faced. Planning for Avalanche, as the Salerno operation was called, suffered from even, even more severely than had Husky from a late start and from a whole, the wide dispersal of various headquarters. Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower, was at Algiers. The Naval Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Cunningham, was at Malta, whilst his military and air colleagues, General Alexander and Air Chief Marshal Tedder, were at Tunis. The immediate tactical command, Lieutenant General Mark Clark, U.S. Army, had his headquarters far to the west at Monstergram, near Oran. The landing for ships were divided into two attacking forces. <clears throat> Under the overall command of Vice Admiral Hewitt, U.S. Navy, who had the title of Naval Commander Western Task Force, the Northern British Attack Force was commanded by Commodore G.N. Oliver. The Southern American Attack Force was commanded by Rear Admiral J.L. Hall, U.S. Navy. The Americans were fortunate in that both their admirals were based at Algiers, together with the military and subordinate naval commanders. Commodore Oliver, on the other hand, had frequently to obtain decisions from Naval Commander-in-Chief at Malta and to coordinate them with the Supreme Commander-in-Chief planning staff at Algiers, with his military commander and senior naval officer landings at Tripoli and with a subsidiary, a subsidiary naval commander at Bizerta. The Bizerta post was held by Rear Admiral Richard L. Connolly, U.S. Navy, who, although senior to Commodore Oliver, had generously volunteered to serve under him in command of a group working on the northern flank of the U British sector. It was not surprising, with such, such a scattered command, that Commodore Oliver subsequently wrote, reported that, By superhuman efforts, all of, or of all concerned, under conditions in which I hope combined operations will never again have to be concerted, uh, the Northern Attack Forces and Senior Air Officer Landing Orders were ready to be issued by the 25th of August, by which time the first copy of the Commander-in-Chief Mediterranean's orders had been received, and the incomplete copy of Naval Commander Western Task Force's orders. Fortunately, my own force, still designated V, <coughs> was not deeply concerned with the many details of timing and routine which were so vital a part of orders for the assault forces. Our duty was to act off the Gulf of Salerno from the first light of D-Day, the 9th September, providing fighter patrols over the beaches through the daylight hours until the airfield at Monte, uh, Monte Covino was captured and the RAF fighters established there. This was expected to be on the second day of the assault. It wouldn't be on the second day of the assault. It would not be till pretty much the fourth day of the assault. As is traditional, things go wrong. Mm. 
By first light on the 9th of September, Force V was in the area allotted to us by Admiral Hewitt, which was 30 miles to seaward of Salerno. At 6.15am, the first sea fire patrols were flown off, and for the remaining hours of daylight, sorties were sent up at hourly intervals, the fighters being able to remain for 80-minute patrols over the beaches. The operation of the five carriers together was a novelty, as only of the recent months had there been enough of them to form a squadron such as that in Force V. The control from a cruiser flagship was an experiment which proved successful, since the small escort carriers had very limited space on their bridges and for operational rooms. In the early far from the noise of flying operations, we were able to give all our attention to manoeuvring squadron to control the aircraft in the air. These included fighters sent from illustrious and formidable of the covering force to give us protection while our own fighters looked after the landing area. Meanwhile, owing partly to the lack of any softening up bombardment, things were not going well ashore. Even on, even on the northern British sector, where support fire from, by crews of destroyers was immediately brought into play, fierce and determined opposition was met with, and progress was slow. In the American sector, the assault bogged down on the beaches, where the troops were pinned by enemy artillery and machine gun fire throughout the first day, suffering severely. So far as the force V was concerned, this meant that we had to operate for considerably longer than had been planned. It had been hoped to withdraw the carriers by the end of the second day. When Montevideo and Mon uh, Montecovino airfield was expected to be allied hands. By the evening of the 10th, however, it was still behind the enemy's lines, and so we prepared for another day's work. By this time, our available fighters had been greatly reduced in numbers, not primarily as a result of air combat, of which there were been a great deal fewer than expected, but owing to the wastage from landings. Now, it is roughly 40 aircraft are lost through landings. 10 through enemy fire and a uh, fighter actions. For the, lot of, for the destruction of three, three, possibly four enemy aircraft. It really wasn't great. It was overwhelmingly lost through attrition of operation. It had been almost flat calm, and since the carriers could not exceed 17 knots, the operation of, land, of landing on the very limited flight deck was an extremely skilled one. The aircraft, naval versions of the Spitfire, not basically designed for deck landing, lacked necessary robustness and were easily damaged by anything but perfect landings. Usually, they pitched forward at the Arrestowire as the Arrestowire was taunted, uh, taunted, damaging their propellers. Captain Henry McWilliam, commander of the escort carrier Hunter, proposed that nine inches should be sawn off the, of all the propeller ends. Neither Grantham nor myself was aerodynamically sure of the soundness of this idea, but we had great faith in the technical knowledge of Captain McWilliam and authorised the operation, which was duly carried out. So far as we could see, the flight of the aircraft was not impaired, whilst the incidence of damaged propellers was greatly lessened. On the evening of the 11th of September, I reported that Force V had about shot its bolt, but there was still no landing ground in Allied hands, and the orders were received to stick at it out, in out for another day. Meanwhile, American engineers, that's when the quote, quote, quote is sent. My carriers will stay here if we have to row back. Meanwhile, American engineers had got to work constructing a landing strip near Pestum, the little town close behind the beaches in their sector. By the 12th it was ready, and on Admiral Hewitt's orders, all our available Spitfires, sea fires, and 26 of them, were sent to operate from it. Force V was then withdrawn, going first to Palermo and then on to Bezzetta. It's fortunate that the Germans did not bring their tactical bombers to the aid of their troops in any great numbers, or our little force of naval fighters would have been hard put to do it to ward them off. After the first two days' of operations, which was all we had expected to cater for, as it was, our pilots were disappointed at the few opportunities given to them to get into action. Instead of air fighting, the enemy concentrated on attacking the Allied bombarding warships with an ingenious new weapon, which was highly successful until countermeasures were improvised. This was the radio control glider bomb. Its existence was partially already known to the Allies, and in fact it had been used on a few occasions against our anti-submarine force in the Bay of Biscay, but no sure antidote to it had yet been devised. The first to be hit by a glider bomb was the United States cruiser Savannah. This was on the morning of the 11th of September. Shortly after that, the US Philadelphia had been narrowly missed. The same afternoon, British cruiser Uganda, lying stopped off the beaches, in the fire support was struck without any warning by a glider bomb launched from an aircraft directly overhead at a height of 20,000 feet. Both these cruisers were with difficulty kept afloat, but eventually re reached port for repairs. Several other ships had narrower escapes. So, amphibious operations, and they end up doing the same in the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean ends up being an entirely escort carrier force, Blasting away positions in support of the army advancing through Burma. 
this is something which escort carriers get used for time and time again. They are better at doing it when they have a ability to maneuver, but honestly, they're even better at it when they don't have sea fires. When they had to use sea fires, you needed space to maneuver them. You needed to be able to give them speed. You need to keep them operating. And these are all things which are learnt as time goes on. But again, you do not always have the time. You do not have the resources. Always have the resources, and you don't always have the space. And all these things have to be balanced. At Salerno, the space is incredibly limited. And I would like to know what the last two destroyers were named because the NCCS-10 probably does. They're probably British. But I know about Cleveland, Halcombe, Aviston, Liddersdale, uh, Farndale, Kelp, and Sizek and Grotsky. Grayek. But I do not know what the last two were. The Battle of Samar. Now, this is one of those operations which really shouldn't happen. Taffy Free has a strength of. Six escort carriers, three destroyers, four destroyer escorts. And, well, there are also aircraft available from Taffy's 1 and 2. The fact that these aircraft carriers, these escort carriers are around is they are there to support the troops ashore. That's what they're there for. That's what they are there to do. The Wildcats, the Hellcats, the Avengers, these aircraft are there to provide support to the Marines ashore. When the carriers come under attack, and it's remember, it's the Taffy 3 carriers which come under attack. The Taffy's 1 and 2 are far enough away they aren't. So they launch their aircraft as well. There are 400 aircraft involved in strikes on the Japanese from all these carriers. But we can sort of consider what happens to them. The Japanese were firing armor-piercing shells, which went often went right straight, straight through the escort carriers without detonating. And they managed to dodge and absorb the shell fire quite well and down attacking aircraft quite well. They didn't all survive. They did not all survive. Um, I think St. Lowe is sunk because she's hit by a kamikaze. And it was the first organized kamikaze attack. Uh, you have White Plains mm, and it survives. Gambia Bay is sunk by naval gunfire. The only one in World War II to be lost to gunfire. Cannon Bay, well, was the trailing ship in the Escort Caravan during the turn to the south and came under intense fire. Um, but she manages to survive, amazingly. Kitkin Bay escaped undamaged. And Fanshawe Bay managed to survive. Which was the mob one which sunk? Was it just two? Yeah, only two were sunk. I thought it was three for some reason in my head. But the thing is, there is a level of professionalism going on. You have to remember, escort carriers, they're not always seen as being the best place for the best crew. You don't send necessarily your best people to them. You would send those to your fleet carriers, to your, uh, you know, force formations. Again, it's kind of like destroyers and escort destroyers and corvettes, etc. You might presume it's not your best people. But they don't know that. And they will often work very hard. And especially when their lives are online, it's amazing what they'll produce. These carriers, they fly off their first strikes with their anti-ground munitions, their ground support munitions, to attack the carriers. There are aircraft doing dry runs at Japanese ships. 
to try and drive them off. And a dry run means you have no weapons left. You're just diving in as if you are attacking with weapons. You have no... You often don't even have machine gun rounds left, let alone bombs, and you're just diving in to try and drive the... to make the Japanese think they're under attack by more aircraft than they are, to distract the AA gunners. In the case of Gambia Bay, um, Chikuma closed to within five nautical miles and finally managed to hit the deck. The Japanese then switched to high explosive shells, which caused her to lose speed, and she was soon dead in the water. This is why when Johnston and other destroyers start to try to draw to attack to try and draw fire away from the carrier she disappears between the waves at 0911 hours after capsizing at 0907 hours four avengers went down with gambia bay 130 of her crew were killed the majority of her survivors were rescued two days later by landing craft and patrol craft dispatched from Laity Gulf. Two days later. That's annoying. But the fact that she manages to launch as many aircraft as she does is pretty darn good. Their reaction times, the decision making process, the command loop. Escort carriers overall. Of 155 aircraft carriers built by the US during World War II, 122 were escort carriers. 122 were the not named ships. The British had roughly six conversions they managed to build themselves, and a few other ships they sort of work on. But the vast majority of escort carriers come from the US and they're the Long Island class, which are also called Archer class in the British terms. Uh, the Avenger class, mm, yeah, only one joins the US Navy. Uh, Sangamon class, four ships, all in US service. The Brogue class, which in British terms are called the Attackers and the Rulers. The Casablanca class, all US service, and the Commencement Bay class. They are the ones which are getting closest to, are you sure you're building an escort carrier or just a small carrier? It's no longer cheap and cheerful. It's got pretty much everything chucked in it. Everything. Summary. Escort carriers. One of the most fought-over developments known to mankind is the amount of people who claim to have come up with the idea. And that probably shows you that no one really did. It was just an obvious one. If you have a fight between one or two people over who comes up with an idea, mm -hmm, you sort of... There, there is a debate. If you have two dozen people all claiming they're the ones who came up with the idea, it was probably a fairly obvious idea to begin with. And does it really matter? You could argue HMS Argus is the first escort carrier. Is she built as such? As such in exercises in the 1920s and 30s? Yes. Does it matter? No. You could argue for Henderson and Goodall. After all, in 1936, they're the ones drawing up plans. But not really, because they're not talking about this as being something new or something innovative. They're talking about it being something that they should have actually done a while before, because they all knew. The ultimate thing about the escort carriers is the sad thing is they're not built when they should have been. 
the British and arguably the Americans should have been churning these out from 1938 onwards. It's kind of like the sloop story. Once you're in a scenario where war is looking certain, this is the time when you start building the small ships. But you always have treasuries. You always have people who are going, well, listen to your better angel angels. Those ships are ships which obviously mean we're preparing for war. The moment you start building these small ships, they can only really be used and justified for the mass construction of a war. If we build them, that's going to raise the tensions. If we start converting merchant ships to escort carriers, it's going to raise tensions. So you don't do it. Then you get the carrier and capital ship stoppage in 1939. And then you get 1940, which is a year of disaster, where the entire strategic understanding of not just Britain, but America, of most of the world, it gets upended. The Japanese weren't expecting France to fall. The Germans weren't expecting France to fall. No one was expecting France to fall. The Germans were even just crossing fingers on Norway. No one saw that coming. This is combined with the fact that, yeah, the bomber might get through. Does that mean your enemy crumples? No. Oh, sugar. An entire basis of belief gets destroyed. And the fact is that that basis of belief then jumps has always depended upon the idea of, first off, when Gilead Duhay wrote it, of using biological warfare loaded up with bombers which are bigger, carry bigger loads than even bombers we build today, nowadays has shifted into the nuclear realm, and, you know, especially after Nagasaki and, Yoko, uh, and Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima. But that's kind of such an overwhelming power if you use it, do you want to use it? But either way, in 1939, 1940, the idea that bomb wars get through and wars will be over quickly because the bombing will stop the war proves ouch. And if you're operating under all those assumptions, if you're operating on the assumption that if you're fighting Japan, you won't need escort carriers. Well, you might need some ships converted to carry, get aircraft out to the Far East and support your merchant, your Navy out there. But that's it. And you, you'll be able to make your choice. It's not as if you're going to need to convoy ships because the Japanese are over in the Pacific. And that's a long way away from the Indian Ocean, let alone the Atlantic. And if you're fighting the Med Italians, well, you seal off the Mediterranean, send in a war fleet, beat the Italians up, and then, you know, peace reigns. And where are the Italian ships going to go? Where are they going to be attacking convoys? The only scenario you need and really justify escort carriers from a British perspective is fighting the Germans. From the American perspective, it's fighting the Japanese, but it's supplying your fleet in wartime. And it's such an obvious need for wartime that you aren't going to get it past the treasury in peacetime. So escort carriers, like sloops, like lots of other things, are absolutely essential in wartime. And in peacetime are incredibly difficult to justify. Oh well. Thank you very much for watching. I always finish these things off with a question, so I am going to finish this one off with a question. And I hope you enjoy it. What would your modern version of an escort carrier look like? What would it be armed with? How would you build it? And where would you build it? What kind of size would it be? It's worthwhile thinking these things through. Would it even have hangar facilities? Would it be 
a continuous flight deck? Would it need to be a continuous flight deck? Now, the interesting question is whether or not you design it with capability to do deal with anti-aircraft as well as anti-submarine. You have to remember with the escort carrier, they start out with anti-aircraft. But also you have to remember this, the more capable and versatile you make the platform, the more in demand it's going to be for other things. The truism of all weapon systems and all things created for the militaries. The more versatile the system, the more in demand it is, the more less likely you are to have available for what you intended it for in the first place. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. What have we got coming up? Next week we have the Brooklyn class cruisers. And we have the Battle of Arusio on the 6th of October. That's going to be fun. Take care, everyone. Hope you enjoyed.